Hello, I'm Nimix, and this is Ford Apocalypse for the Commodore 64. My decision on tasking this came from my experiences playing this in my youth and wanting to know its limitations. Late 2019, I started the tasking process and would periodically get discouraged. Throughout the past three and a half years, I set this project to the side many, many times due to failed attempts on accomplishing task-only strategies. It was then, in January 2023, I finally buckled down and finalized this work having solved all the issues that were prohibiting me from moving forward, including new ones just recently found. Because of the amount of time, detail, and troubles that I went through, I decided to make a small documentary on my efforts. I normally wouldn't do this for such a small and short-running game, but there was much work that went into this, including spots that were botted that I wanted to talk about. In fact, analyzing this game was more intense than most other games I've done on platforms such as Nintendo. If you are aware of this game, I think you're about to be pleasantly surprised, as I am completely satisfied with the outcome. So, let's get started. The first detail I want to point out is, RNG is a huge factor in this game. By the time this game starts, two things have already been established. First, the layout of enemies and people in need of rescue in the vaults of Draconis. Second, the decision on which side the barrier will show on the reactor core later in the next phase of the game called the Crystalline Caves. In regards to the placing of enemies and people, you'll notice on the input file from the frame ranges of 2794 through 2988, random inputs have been applied across the second player's joystick. This section is where I controlled RNG for that decision to be made. Now, of course, the code didn't need this range to figure that out, but one frame isn't going to be enough to force the game's code into making the decision that I wanted. So this area was botted with one of my many methods that I use to force RNG to my liking. This particular method is something that I do strictly on the Commodore 64 only. Why? Because the C64 core used in the BizHawk emulator runs almost 90 frames per second on my Ryzen 3950X and this alternate method yielded better results by controlling that RNG across large spans of frames in a reasonable time. As for the other point, the barrier placement for the reactor core was decided early in the game. Now this surprised me, since the game only loads up one area at a time into the same RAM locations for use by the game's code. I'm not sure why this decision was made at this point, but frame 2793 which is the frame after starting the game with the fire button, is where this decision is made. Now, as we traverse this game, I'll point out these places where RNG was forced and why this made the difference. This is the entry into the vaults of Draconis. Up until this point, you have normal human interactions. But here is our first trick that is mostly task only. A human can likely pass through, but they can't be guaranteed a pass. These flashing blocks below are called mines. You must position the helicopter to face forward and bomb out these mines to clear away as we are opening up a three block path. But a collision is highly likely. For this task, the helicopter will be manipulated to avoid pixel collision of specific objects by varying my speed downward and maybe a left and right tap of the joystick. Most gaming consoles operate on the principle of a hitbox. With the Commodore, there are sprite registers that give indications when sprites are touching each other and other objects. One thing you might be noticing is why do you still see some parts of the helicopter touching these objects? This leads me to another discussion about the layout of the playing field. During my investigation of randomly placed objects, I discovered two different locations being used. One for static objects like ground and objects that are not affected by weapons, and the other for objects that are set for interaction. Strangely enough, it's not the dynamic obstacles, but objects that are placed on the static map that are appearing and disappearing. Now this confused me, but later I discovered how to detect the barrier around the reactor core. Now this is when I finally realized that touching flashing parts of the mines was what I needed to avoid. Now, the layout is a continuous playing field that wraps around indefinitely. So if you continue moving horizontally, you will eventually see this point again. I bring this point up because a choice must be made to go right or left. In this case, it is going to be faster to take the left route 
for reasons of exploiting a mechanic that can only occur from the left side of an object. I'll hold on to that detail for now, but I want to recall your attention to my early attempts at forcing RNG. Here, my efforts of forcing RNG are now realized as you'll see the lost people in need of rescuing. In order to continue on towards the next area, you must pick up these individuals. If you don't, the opening to the upcoming area will be unavailable. There are eight total, and I have manipulated the game to show them in two areas on the way towards the crystalline caves. Now, it was very important to me that I didn't use cheap tactics like shooting them, which in some cases could make the operation faster. So I fixed their route and forced RNG to place them on my way to the next area to prevent delays. Here, the same situation applies as the entry point of the vaults of Draconis. This time, the manipulation occurs in a horizontal fashion with the same collision considerations. You'll notice that I'm seemingly shooting at random. This is being done for two reasons. One, every shot causes these moving walls to change direction. Two, the non-moving flashing walls can be manipulated when they're not on screen. So earlier shots can be made to get them to show opened where they might have been closed before, thus giving me an uninterrupted run. Okay, we finally reached the end of the first area where I'm exploiting an early detection on this landing pad. My suspicion is that the bottom right corner of my sprite is being used to trigger the landing sequence. Coming in from the other side, this cannot be done as the helicopter is almost fully on the landing pad before the trigger occurs. So this is the primary reason why I chose the left route when entering this vault. Okay, you're probably wondering how I'm going to make it through this game with such a low amount of fuel. About mid-January 2023, I was almost at the point of submitting this task when I stumbled on the automatic refueling of my helicopter. This glitch seemed very rare as I couldn't reproduce it easily, but after a few weeks of analysis, I eventually found out how to reproduce it consistently. Even though I still don't understand why this occurs programmatically, I did see key things occurring that led me to reproducing it. My analysis showed four points that must be considered when triggering this event. One, you must have at least two people to rescue. Two, the fuel timer must freeze momentarily. Three, you cannot have zero fuel, which was my original effort. Four, there seems to be a game timer that I had to delay for. In this task, you'll see that I delayed a bit during the rescue to sync up with this mysterious occurrence. This is another segment that was extremely frustrating. Here, I'm having to clear a path through these mines to get to the reactor core. There was a lot of collision avoidance and movement optimization. This is when I found out how detailed the movement is and how much time could be saved by playing around with the inputs. Additionally, there were moments when one shot could destroy two mines at once. Once I understood all these mechanics, I was able to get through this segment with great satisfaction. At this point, we have an opening to the reactor core. Going back to the start of the game, the frame immediately following the first press of the fire button decided which side the reactor would be open on. Now that we have that opening, the primary goal of this game is at hand. Remember the flashing walls in the vaults of Draconis? Well, the same thing occurs here with the reactor, where random blocks would pop up as shields. This is also controlled with random shooting before the reactor becomes visible on the screen. At this part of the task, all situations have been figured out and we are in the optimal situation that I've been striving for. There are two routes that lead you to the reactor core. Having been able to manipulate the barrier on the side of my choosing, I originally chose to approach the reactor from the right side. This side is much more entertaining but it is 323 frames slower over the left side approach. I didn't want this work to go to waste, so I decided to include it in this documentary and leave the alternate approach for the main submission movie. When you do watch the main video, both versions will eventually sync up when ascending into the previous area. Believe it or not, we are still not finished with all the techniques being exploited. Here you will notice the tank was destroyed before I cleared away the mines and the wall. This was a form of clipping. 
which was easily accomplished by letting off the left direction of a frame or two. This was a critical spot to prevent time loss, as the tank would have shot missiles and forced me to wait for clearance. This clip prevented me from having to slow down. As we approach the ending of this game, we once again are exploiting the trigger to end the game by touching the landing pad from the left side. As you can see, this game, as simple as it looks, had a decent amount of tricks to use. I appreciate your attention. I will be available for questions, so please ask. Well, time for me to move on to another project. Have a great one.